once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I am Doug Keck, your host, and our guest author is Christopher Karstens, author of A Devotional Journey into the Mass, published by our friends at Sophia Institute Press, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. And welcome, Christopher, to EWTN's Bookmark. Thanks, Doug. Uh, people might have seen you when you were on with Father Mitch back in this past March, and also one time you were here earlier, you were on a show with uh, Colin Donovan in our Theology Roundtable. Right. right, we were trying to understand the, the new translation. Back then it was the new translation of the words of the Mass. Right, exactly. And at that time you also, now you're involved with Adoramus, and Helen right. Hall Hitchcock, who was on our board for years, who obviously has passed on, mm -hmm. uh, was involved in that as well. She helped found that, right? She did, and that was the only time we got to meet Helen, so I'm right. really grateful for, for that uh, trip to EWTN. Now, I'm interested in this, how Mass can become a time of grace, nourishment, and devotion, but it says in the beginning, this is some sort of spiritual direction series, and lo and behold, the one and only Dan Burke shows mm -hmm. up right at the beginning here, mm -hmm. and he seems to be involved with commissioning you to do this. So. What is the Spiritual Direction series and how did this book come about for you partaking in it? I've asked myself that same okay. question. Uh, it's uh, the Spiritual Direction series and very uh, a lot of what, uh, what Dan Burke does is, is to help to help Catholics to uh, invigorate their spiritual life. We, we do lots of things, external mm -hmm. things, whether it's the Mass or the Rosary, for mm -hmm. example, but how can these, how can these be uh, uh, spiritually enriching for us. And so that's mm -hmm. what uh, is the genesis of this book. How is it that when we go to the Mass, it can be a time of spiritual enlightenment and nourishment? Right. Now, Dan mentions right in the beginning uh, 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 Romano Guardini. I think the first time I really heard his name mentioned was by Scott Hahn a number of mm -hmm. years ago, came up. Who is he and why is he so important? Romano Guardini is very important. Uh, he really began, this according to Pope Benedict, began the, the modern liturgical movement in Germany with a book that he wrote about a hundred years ago called uh, The Spirit of the Liturgy, which mm -hmm. Pope Benedict would later name his own uh, book. So he, he was a very influential theologian and liturgist uh, it, to modern popes even, Pope Benedict and even mm -hmm. Pope Francis uh, studied Ro uh, Romano Gardini in his own uh, doctoral studies. Right. Now, Dan says this book is meant to make up for what is lacking in the faithful's understanding of authentic liturgical participation, help clarify the authentic intent and wisdom of the Council while mirroring as much as possible mm -hmm. Gordini's powerful devotional tone. What's lacking? Okay, this is a devotional journey. I mean, the whole Mass is a prayer. So uh, isn't it always devotional oriented? And, and what are we missing today? Yeah, an original uh, subtitle of this text was How to Participate in the Mass as the Church Intends. And so what we see is lacking is that since the Council, this term active participation, mm -hmm. which the Council Fathers themselves said is the aim to be considered before all others in the reform and restoration of the liturgy. This has been misunderstood mm -hmm. by many of us uh, oftentimes Which to Which you talk about in the book, right? Yeah, to, right. to be kind of an external ministerial type of activity. Well, it seems like a lot of people were very, very busy inside the church sometimes. They should be busy inside themselves. Right. That's exactly what And maybe what, going, what going externally outside the parish and carrying that with them, right? Right. I mean, the apostolate uh, is just that, of the, of the laity is mostly to take what we take in, uh, from inside right. the Mass and out into the world. That's that's what we wanted to recover, how to actively participate in the saving work of Jesus in our hearts and in our souls and in our minds. Now he asks a bunch of questions and makes some statements. What is it that we want from God in the Mass? What is it that he wants from us? I don't What do we want from God in the Mass? <laughs> Well, we can want to get mad at us because we showed up. To <laughs> well, thank it us, might be that. To thank us for showing up. Sometimes you hear that. Uh, well, the, we, we, we want and we should want a lot of things from God. Isn't there this anecdote of St. Therese of Lisieux when her sisters were giving away their dolls before they went to the convent? She said she wanted all of them. So, and that's the type of, uh, we should be able to ask for all sorts of things from God. Um, but in the end, what we should want from God is to be godlike, to be saints. And that, that's, or should be uh, our greatest desire that we should cultivate to be like him. So goes on, so how can we encounter him in the Mass in a way that refreshes our souls and draws us even more deeply into his presence? And are there ways in which we can better prepare ourselves for life-changing encounter? And that's kind of what you go through in the book. Yeah, yeah. How is it that when we go to Mass, it can be cease being rather going through the motions, but really have an internal effect on us uh, to make us joyful, to make us saints? Now it says here that the Mass is the idea of mystagogy. This is this word that only shows up once in a while around Lent. Mm. People say, everybody scratches their head and figures, well, the priest knows what he's talking about. Process whereby we're led from the sacred signs of the liturgy to the heavenly realities they contain. Please explain. 
You know, the, what Gardini would say in his book, Sacred Signs, and what this book is founded upon is sacramentality, that the unseen work of God comes through us through visible, audible, uh, olfactory things. Uh, that's what a sacrament is, is an outward sign. Well, anybody who's paying attention can at least hear the smells and uh, the smells and the bells and the rest, but we want to be led deeper than that. This is what mystagogy does. Uh, this word agog means to lead, so a teacher is a pedagogue because he or she leads children. Mm -hmm. What mystagogy does is to lead you from what you can see to what you cannot, and that's what's really nourishing. I mean, a lot of masses you go to, there's no smells or bells. Well, that's why what the job of the, uh, of the priest is, is to create a tapestry with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, this beautiful work of art so that Jesus can radiate through. So the, the minister's job is to create a great work of art. Mm -hmm. The people's job is to learn how to see it. Now, I was surprised to find out that eating donuts after Mass is not the highlight of going to Mass. <laughs> it could be one of the reasons, but it shouldn't be the highlight. Well, who did you interview for that? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, somebody asked my son, Lawrence, <laughs> who's uh, five years old, what he liked most, a liturgist's son, right? Mm -hmm. What does he like most about going to Mass? And he responded, eating donuts afterward. And I thought, all right, well, that's, I guess that's a good start. The Holy Spirit brings us to Mass in a variety of ways, but if Lawrence says donuts when he's 15 years old, he probably won't even be going to Mass when he's 25 years old. So how can I lead Lawrence kind of mystagogically from what, right. he, what he sees and smells in the Mass to, to this encounter with Christ? Now, the way you broke the book out, you kind of give the eight simple ways to engage physically and spiritually, bodily and soul. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's mm -hmm. the format of the book. These eight reflections emanate from these foundational concerns. Let's go through the spiritual meaning of the eight elements of the mass. Right, well what is it, uh, as I say, we can, we can, if we're paying attention, we can see what's going on externally, but beneath that external activity, word, song, vestment, door, piece of architecture, Sunday, there's an internal uh, reality, and that's what mystagogical insight mm -hmm. does. Sometimes I give this example, like if you go to a 3D movie and you're not wearing the glasses, you can kind of get a sense of what's going on, but it's a little blurry around the edges. Mm -hmm. As soon as you put on those goggles, wow, the, the movie stands out in great relief and beauty, and you find yourself dodging you know, superheroes and Is that and what's next, 3D masses? <laughs> Mystic goggles, <laughs> oh, Mystic goggles. Oh, okay. So we, there's a certain way to see the mass that helps us to penetrate beneath the outward signs. You go on, how can we fully actively consciously participate in them and how our participation ought to affect our lives in the world outside the Mass. And you talk about the major themes and also at the end of the introduction you say, Jesus doesn't need our help in redeeming the world, but he wants it. Why? Well, we can ask him that someday, <laughs> God willing. Uh, he wants us to be uh, active participants in our own salvation. Not okay. that we're going uh, right. neo-Pelagiate here, right. but he, he wants us to, to assist him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't save us against our wills. He wants us to join with him. So while he's the primary operator, we become co-operators. Right. He's the principal actor, but we are co-actors. Right. Who He wants us to assist him, and he helps us. Chapter one, how to enter the church building. I didn't know that that was such a major question for most of us. And you also talk about the church having a face. How so? Well, the edifice, I think etymologically, probably mm -hmm. means a face. So the church mm -hmm. building uh, is this really this, this image of Christ himself. And we can, it's an image of heaven. And while we might slip in the side door of heaven, I mean, we should, we should want to enter in through uh, the, main, the main entrance. And so what the door is meant to symbolize. So we can't come in the side door? Uh, well, if, if that gets us <laughs> in, Only if Mass we'll already started or something? <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> okay. uh, ideally, we should go, Jesus is the one who calls himself the door. Mm -hmm. So uh, if yeah, we- Yeah, you put if, that scripture quote if right we If we take that for, for what it means, then, then even walking through the door, when seen sacramentally can be this encounter right. with Jesus and an occasion for grace. So why, why would you right. avoid that? Okay. Go, go in the main door. Now, you, you <laughs> refer to the fact, when I asked you to imagine your parish church, were you uncertain where to look? Why would people be uncertain where to look? Well, the point we're trying to make there is that uh, we recognize uh, where the front of the church is through sacramental signs. See, this is called the sacramental principle, mm -hmm. that human beings uh, receive information and give information through their senses. Uh, we understand the questions and the answers we're giving each other because of this medium that we mm -hmm. can hear. Well, God is sympathetic to that, and so he uses sacraments, signs, symbols to communicate with us. This is the sacramental principle. And so we know what the front of the church looks like, 
versus the back of the church because of the signs and symbols it employs. Steps, doors, lights, decorations, crosses, and the rest. And so nobody ever pulls up to mass, I, I don't think. You mean so all those accretions have meaning? That is exactly right. Okay. Everything has meaning, okay. and they're not accretions. I mean, right. they can be accretions. The council wanted the uh, the signs and symbols to be to be truly authentic, and mm -hmm. whatever were accretions should be uh, cut away. But yes, there, there, there's no God is in the details, mm -hmm. and so these small signs. Yeah, you say and symbols, that in the book as well. Yeah. yeah. So that's right. that's where we encounter Christ. Right. You say, like Jesus, and you mentioned that about him, the church has a sacramental quality about her. Just meaning all those different things you just mentioned. Uh, sort of, but even the church herself, the mystical body of Christ. Okay. I think here, um, the Second Vatican Council invokes this, and I think it's a line from St. Augustine, that as Jesus, who's the second Adam, lay sleeping at the tree in this garden, his side is open up, and out comes the wondrous sacrament of the whole church. Mm -hmm. And so there's this language in the tradition that speaks of the church as a sacrament. Well, what is a sacrament but an outward sign of an inward reality? So when we see the church doing things, mm -hmm. preaching the good news, serving the poor, worshiping God, when we see those externally, it's, uh, it's a sign and a manifestation and a presentation of the invisible mystical body of Christ. Right, so when you say as Catholics we see the same Savior at least every Sunday at Mass, but not only in the Blessed Sacrament. Right, so while the Eucharist is the most important sacrament and the other sacraments that surround it are means to encounter Christ, we, our, our vision shouldn't stop there. Mm -hmm. The sacramentals and even things that have a sacramental quality about them, like the door or the stained glass window or the priest's vestment or hearing the sanctus, mm -hmm. All of those have these sacra the, the sacramental flavor about mm -hmm. them that if we can hear and sense them mystagogically, mm -hmm. it, it becomes an encounter with an unseen reality, which is Jesus. Now, at the end of each chapter, you have in brief, and then you have a little section the next time you go to Mass, and then you make a couple of points here. Uh, one of them, uh, as a parent, this must be important, pay attention, uh, <laughs> you have as one of the things, the miracle of wedding feast that came and happened because Mary noticed that the couple was out of wine, so we need to pay attention to because there's a lot going on, mm -hmm. I guess. Why did you decide to lay this out like that? Is this like a little study that way? or uh, It's kind of, uh, well, it is. It's a how-to manual. Each okay. of the chapters is called How to Walk into the Church Building, you say, yeah. How to Make the okay. Sign of the Cross. And so the book is not uh, academic, abstract, uh, highly theological. It's substantive and mm -hmm. theological and orthodox, but it's, it's very practical, too, so that you can do it. I can teach a five-year-old. My five-year-old can't read this, but I right. can teach him how to do these things. Right. So it's very, uh, very on the ground. Okay. And how to make the sign of the cross. Again, I didn't know there had to be a whole chapter on how you do that. <laughs> uh, we had Bert Gezi did a whole bunch of spots for us on, on uh, sacramental sign of the cross. More troubling than losing our physical sight, though, is losing our mental sight. What's our mental sight? It's uh, being able to see spiritual realities, I mm -hmm. suppose, uh, that, um, you know, we, we have a natural 2020 vision, or hope we do, or strive to that. You wear glasses or have LASIK mm -hmm. if you don't. Right. Well, there's a supernatural vision that the church wants us to have, too, so that we can see right. spiritual realities. That's that liturgical clarity. LASIK surgery that you're liturgical promoting Liturgical LASIK here? surgery, you're yes. You're promoting or something? Yes, yeah. And that really works? It does. <laughs> it does. Well, I, I hope, Doug. I mean, you, you tell me, can, when you made the sign of the cross, uh, did you make it any differently after reading that uh, chapter? I mean, there, Pope Francis, in fact, spoke recently about this. Parents, you need to teach your children how to make the sign of the cross because mm -hmm. it just looks like shooing flies or something right. like that. Right. But when you make well, the sign of the cross, when you make it with intention right. and you know from, from which this, uh, you know, the sources where the, si the sign came from, well, then it becomes just loaded with reality mm -hmm. and loaded with spiritual insight. Well, you say that, and that it's in brief, you tell the Catholics celebrate a sacramental liturgy, our faith formation encourages a mystical catechesis, which leads us to the outward sign of a sacramental sign to an inward reality. Then you say, the sign of the cross in its words and gestures is essentially a rich sign in the Mass like any tree in the natural world. This tree of life extends its root into multi-layered soil. This comes directly out of the, the catechism, which okay. very early in its part two, uh, it explains what mystagogy is. And then it explains, well, where do you find these sources of liturgical signs and symbols? So if you imagine a tree uh, uh, planted in the soil, you've mm -hmm. you know, got some rocky level, you've got a, a, a loamy level, you have some topsoil, and the fruit that it yields is the way it is because the, the roots have extended into the soil. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know why that fruit, the apple or the sign of the cross or the sanctus, 
what, how it means what it does, mm -hmm. you clear away the soil and you look to the roots of where it came from. And now all of a sudden when I say Sanctus, when I make the sign mm -hmm. of the cross and I know the sources from which it came, now it starts to have a little bit of a pop, a little bit more of impact. Why do you think so many of us are, are so uneducated about the roots of the things that we express on a regular basis when we go to Mass? So people haven't told us. Mm -hmm. I think it's as simple as that. Was it also because some people didn't think it was important? Well, I think that too is, you know, the, the, the Mass is a sacramental animal. That's its reality. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have an appreciation of signs or symbols, we don't think they're important, for example, or we don't appreciate that this is the way Jesus uh, uh, instituted to come to us, well, then, then we can look at the Mass as a series of rules or as a uh, historical thing or as a communitarian event. And all those things are true, mm -hmm. but it, it, it misses what it is essentially. So what I hope this book does is to uh, give a greater appreciation mm -hmm. for everything sacramental because anything from the door to the blessed sacrament, they're mm -hmm. not the same thing, right. but both can become true encounters with Jesus. Well, you also talk about in the brief section here, uh, talking about the opening prayer and the collect, there's a, there's a word I remember as a kid, you mm -hmm. don't hear it. I used to thought that had to do with the collection, but apparently not. That was <laughs> collecting us together, collection. right? <laughs> but silence both within the liturgy and outside of it is necessary to hear God's voice and to formulate our intentions and desires for God. That seems to be one of the great challenges, I would think. Certainly outside, the idea of silence is almost impossible. But even in, ma in the Mass, where there used to be, in the past, seemed to be more of an interest in silence. It mm -hmm. seemed like to some degree over the last 30 or 40 years, yeah. there was this intentionality of this activity over silence. True, and in fact, if silence can almost be uncomfortable, right? Like we don't want too much silence right now in the show, or if, if the, uh, in the mass if there's too mm -hmm. much silence, the people, th oh, did somebody forget to do something? But silence is essential and Pope, Pope Benedict says that uh, there's an anthropological mutation that can take place because of all of the noise. Mm -hmm. Pope Francis constantly speaks of silence. Cardinal Seurat wrote a whole, it's kind right. of funny, right? 300 pages on silence. Uh, but it's essential. We hear it in the Bible. We, we, we know it even culturally after a national tragedy or something like that. This is like our only go-to right, moment, uh, of moment silence, is, a, is a moment of silence. So right. I think we all recognize its importance, but, but it's, hard to, it's hard to achieve. I get in, in my car way. at the end of the day and I just, I've got to turn on that radio. Right. Um, but it, it's, it's a quality we need to foster in ourselves. Right. How to listen to the readings. You say, with the Second Vatican Council, the church has refocused on how we should, how she should proclaim the word of God to her members. Why did it need to be refocused? What was unfocused? Well, I think um, the, the caricature, real or imagined, is Catholics were good on sacraments and non-Catholics or Protestants were good on the word. Right. Uh, yeah. Maybe that's true, maybe it, uh, maybe it isn't, but there's a, there's a real appreciation that you know, the liturgical renewal came about with a scriptural renewal as well. And so the council wanted to, to open up the treasures, the nourishment of the word. You know, there's, I think it's in the book of Revelation where the angel tells John to roll up the scroll and to eat it. And even the, the council and its documents speak it's about a nourishment from the table of the word mm -hmm. that can really uh, um, change us mm -hmm. and uh, divinize us. Well, listen, my child, with the ear of your heart. Mm. You, you pointed that out uh, right after the <laughs> fall of basically Rome mm. that came to fall. Yeah, this is the, the opening line of St. Benedict's rule. And even the word benedicere or benedict means to speak well. So it's a very, he's got a very fitting title. Mm. And what we're supposed to do in the liturgy of the word is to listen with our hearts, right? How many times you've mm -hmm. told your kids or grandkids, you know, it goes in, it, take my words to heart mm -hmm. versus having the word go in one ear and out the other. How is it that we can listen with the ears of our heart so the word doesn't go in one ear and out the other? Because what God wants, he's not delivering a monologue to us. He wants to to converse with him, to be in a dialogue. So he wants us to take that word to heart and then speak back to him from our hearts. But we can't speak to him from our hearts if the word has never penetrated into the heart mm. in the first place. So I thought St. Benedict's line there was uh, absolutely appropriate. We kind of list, the, there's the reading, how to engage the text at hand, the reflection, response, contemplation, resolution, which again, the, the idea of the Catholic, what actions has this reading inspired me to carry out in life opening before me in the week ahead because uh, many times sometimes we close the door at mass and then we don't open that idea up again until we open the door up the following yeah. sunday yeah well i don't know uh, do you remember what the reading was from last sunday 
Uh, I'm trying to remember myself. Yeah. Anybody listening? Uh, if this is the, this word is supposed to have an impact on our right. lives and to move us, and and it's just we close the book and we close the door right. and we go on with our week. Well, that's that's not a very powerful word. This is what. The church has always right. wanted, but especially with the, the council, really having, letting that word uh, change us. Well, you even talk about the idea of maybe looking at the readings ahead of time, et cetera. You know, the kind of thing if you're a, you, you're, you tend to be uh, one of the commentators or a lector, you get the book and you can kind of uh -huh. do that ahead of time. Mm -hmm. But most of the average people don't tend to do that. That's why actually even watching EW10 Mass during the week where you hear sometimes uh, the repeat of some of the gospels that and the readings that you hear on Sunday, it's a good way of refreshing that. It is. I, I, I confess to, I've said uh, when the lector, the, the deacon says the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, I have no idea what I've just heard because I've been thinking about, you know, the football game coming up or what's for lunch well, or whatever do, it is. Now you as a liturgist, do you recommend, uh, you know, the word is being expounded that so you shouldn't read in your missile along or is it okay for some people who hear, you know, learn auditorially, others need to see it at the same yeah, time? Yeah, some, some liturgists have very strong opinions right, about right. this. I think you should do whatever can get Works that word you, right. into Works your you, heart. Right. In a perfect and ideal world, I suppose, right. uh, we wouldn't need to follow along with books, but until that perfect right. world comes along, do whatever it takes to get that word into your heart. Right, the word of God is, simple, is not simply text and words spoken at mass, but first and foremost is a person, the word of the Trinity. All liturgical words in some way make audible this divine word. In fact, sometimes you're trying to remind people, EWT means the Eternal Word mm -hmm. Television mm -hmm. Network. It's not the Bible we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the same case here, the Word of God is not a word. That's right. Every, that every audible word that, that you can hear is, is sacramental in some way. So it's, it's, it contains in a certain way and is a bear of the Eternal Word. So to hear that, to pray that, to sing mm -hmm. that word is to uh, sing and pray and hear the eternal word. It's an encounter with, right. with God. And you talk about in the section, prepare the uh, heart at the offertory. In the brief you say, sacrifice, which is at the heart of Jesus' saving work, the mass, and the Christian life means giving undivided love to God the Father. Now there's, there's a whole issue there, obviously. There First of all, our issue. culture doesn't like sacrifice. Mm. And certainly even liturgically inside the church, you know, when you get the table of the Lord mm -hmm. and and the appropriate understanding that there's a meal aspect, obviously, mm -hmm. from the Last Supper, but sometimes that can be pushed so hard that the sacrificial aspect seems to get pushed off the table. In fact, it goes from being an yes. altar to a table. Right. Uh, it is a table, but it's a sacrificial table. It is a banquet, but it's a sacrificial banquet. And those two things have to be held uh, uh, in tension and, uh, together. Yeah, th there is an issue with sacrifice. Pope Benedict says in his book, The Spirit of the Liturgy, that it's a concept buried beneath the debris of endless misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. Well, if sacrifice is the heart of Jesus' ministry and of the churches and of is the key to my sanctity, and I don't know what it is, that's a real problem uh, for me. And so what uh, this book relies heavily on Pope uh, Benedict in this chapter, right. trying to recover a true notion of sacrifice. Mm. Okay. In the section participating in the Eucharistic prayer, a priest is a mediator in between heaven and earth uh, called Pontifex. His role is to, to bridge the divide between God and man. Now, either it seems to people think there isn't any divide anymore or, or it can't be bridged. And certainly many times I don't think a lot of Catholics see that that's what the whole idea of what the priest offering is. There seems to be this idea like, the priest may be the presider, but it's basically mm -hmm. all of us in this. Yeah, well, first of all, is there a divide? This is, reminds me of a Chesterton line. This is the only doctrine of the Catholic faith that you can uh, prove by reading the, the newspaper or blog. Right. There's something not right with the world or right. with me. Uh, with, the, with the priest's job, and Jesus is the high priest, we use this analogy of the, or this image of the Sistine Chapel with God reaching out and Adam there. This gap between them opens up with sin. And what Jesus does is he bridges mm -hmm. the gap between them. That's what a pontifex does. Mm -hmm. Literally is a bridge builder. Jesus is the pontifex maximus because he builds the greatest bridge. And the ordained priest in the person of Christ mm -hmm. helps to build that bridge. And baptized priests, with we join our sacrifices with uh, the priest at the altar mm -hmm. who joins them with Jesus and we cooperate in building this bridge from earth to heaven. Mm -hmm. That's what we're baptized to do. So from the time that uh, Mr. Burke came to you and said, oh, we'd like you to mm. do something on this for the spiritual direction series, how long did it take you to put this together? 
Uh, the book took about four or five months to write, but it's, uh, it's the blessed fruit of uh, 20 years of working in the Diocese of La Crosse and other places, so I just wrote down the things that I get to do all the time. Well, when do you write? When do I write? Yeah, when do you Whenever write? Whenever I can, yeah. you know, like if, Do you use, like, a, I mean, do you use a, a laptop, an iPad, do you do oh, on a no, plane, you're writing on no, planes and no, things? No, 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 I have, I have a little office uh, in the basement of my house that I go to, uh, and the environment's just so, otherwise I don't work well. And you also <laughs> do Adoramus uh, from the same Yes, thing? edit uh, the And Adoramus how often does that come out now, just? It comes out uh, every other month, but we're working right. to increase Great. the We'll put the per website year. up for that, too, Thank to keep, you. Uh, Thank keep you. that up there as well. So we're just about out of time. Thank you so much, uh, Christopher Karsten. My pleasure. Thanks for, for having joining me, me here on Bookmark, for being on Thank with you. Father Mitch, author of A Devotional Journey into the Mass, published by our friends at Sophia Institute Press, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. Check it out, especially for your family. You've got young kids. It's a good introduction to how you should treat the Mass. See you next time right here on Bookmark. Thanks. <laughs>